what have you learned about, Troy's been teaching the message, John, Love, and Thunder. What have you learned about John so far? So quiet. <laughs> no, I, I mean, it's been a lot of good stuff that we've covered. The Apostle John, one of the twelve, called by Jesus. Love and thunder, those two words. I know you guys in the front know, yeah. Love and thunder. Love is because? Because he was the one who Jesus loved. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, it's like, you know, this is an easy one to go. Thunder, what's that one? Could be, yep. Kind of, yep. Go ahead. Well, and yeah, Troy talked about that too. And so he was also; they were the sons of thunder. So maybe his dad was a unique kind of character too, like the loud cowboy dad. I don't know, maybe, possibly. But known, John and James were known as the sons of thunder for their zeal, for their love, for their boldness, for their intensity. But yeah, John was the disciple that Jesus loved, the beloved. Okay. We're going to talk about, we're talking about two people, but first I want to introduce my title for tonight, Verticality. A verticality, we want to have vertical spiritual living. You with me? You ever heard this word before? Any frame of reference for verticality? Like here's a good one, surfing. What would verticality and surfing be? We moved from New Jersey. I never did surf, but you know, I'm not going to play. What, what did anybody say? Verticality and surfing would be? Not falling off the board. That'd be good. Yeah, stay vertical. That's very literal. I like that one, yeah. But also, you know, if you want to ride the wave, the true rules of surfing are go where the deep, go where the deep water is and then do the counterintuitive thing of leaning into the wave as it's coming at you to gain momentum. Verticality. Verticality and climbing. What do you think that would be? Rock climbing. What do you think that would be? Going up. I, I love it. That's awesome. I like your uh, Indiana Jones hat too, Ken. I like that, man. Hiking. You were in theme tonight. Anybody else? Rock climbing, verticality and climbing would be, I heard something over here. Here's the interesting thing about verticality. It's not, you can say vertical living, it's an adjective. Verticality is a noun. We're talking about the spiritual aspect of verticality. Verticality is something that's totally 90 degree to the horizon, right? Verticality on the side of a cliff would be you stand below it and <laughs> that's it. The interesting thing about rock climbing is that when you, that vertical face, Okay, it's not only getting height, but when you are on the rock going straight up, they call it two-dimensional climbing. Why would you think that is? Because hopefully you're not going that way. <laughs> and you're not going this way, so you're only going this way or this way. And when you're on the side of a sheer face like that, there's a, there's a line that you look for. And the only thing you can see, verticality, is I can see where my hands go, and I only have one way to go. It's up. Now, what a perfect spiritual illustration. What a perfect idea of what the spiritual dimension looks and feels like, right? Verticality. So this is what we want to achieve. There's a guy, by the way, we're going to, uh, we can flip to the next slide so you can see the reference. We're going to 1 John chapter 3, 16 through 20. There's some people I like to read, and there's a great quote that I want to read to you by a guy named Charles Finney in the Second Great Awakening. Uh, he said this, think about this as a challenge of our time. If the presence of God, Charles Finney said in 1840, if the presence of God is in the church, the church will draw in the world. That's us, we're the church. If the presence of God is in the church, the church will draw in the world. Look around you, you guys. I mean, God's doing something cool here at SVSU on his house, isn't he? There's been baptisms. Look at the relationships and community that's happening around here. It's uncommon, right? God's doing something. So if God is in, because we, we, his house Tuesday night church, what we call it, right? Church. If the presence of God, Charles Finney said, is in the church, the church will draw the world, the outside world in. But if the presence of God is not in the church, the world will draw the church out into its secularized world culture. Isn't that interesting? Because to me that speaks about this idea of vertical living, living in Christ. When I'm on the face of the, this rock, I'm looking up and I'm looking for handholds and footholds and I'm only going one direction. This is what we want to achieve. When I look at what, we, what I pray for you guys, what I pray for, my wife's right here, hi wife, <laughs> and our friend Derek. But when I pray for the people at our church, when I pray for you guys, when we were at leaders retreat, when we were at fall retreat, what am I praying? I'm saying, Lord, help everybody's heart be so towards you that there's momentum in one direction, verticality. There's potency that comes with that kind of life in Christ. You with me? 
So we're looking at the Apostle John. Let's look at 1 John. Troy read from John, but Apostle John also wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and famously Revelation, right? Some debate about that, but probably. So 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 through 20, and I'm going to read out loud, so read with me. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 16. John writes, By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren and sistren. It's not in there, but it means the same thing. Okay. <laughs> But whoever has this world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, look at how that's phrased, shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth, and by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Now, two things stand out to me, really three. One is, we live in a time, one is the two times that John says in this passage, look at the phrase, by this we know. By this we know. We live in a time where it's very unpopular to say that you're sure of anything. Do you guys feel this? Secularism. A guy I listened to, we listened to, John Tyson, says what's happening in culture around us that you guys, that your generation has lived in and is living in, he says the secularism in our culture is so, ta- is so intense that it's like a reverse exorcism. Secularism seems to be going out in culture and saying, where can I find God and how can I rip him out of culture and put darkness back in? That's a time that you live in. What's needed? See, here's the trick. The, the moment that Christ was in the tomb, The devil thought he had won the greatest victory, but what happened next? It's like, oh no! (laughs) Right? I heard a pastor one time say, I don't know if the devil has nightmares. Like, I don't know the theology of that. But if he does, like later on, after the cross, was he like, did he he wake up having a nightmare? And the demons were like, oh no, no, it's okay. It's just a dream. They're like, no, it's not a dream. It really happened. You know, like we got him in the grave. No, he, yeah, it really happened. And then Pentecost, and you're like, oh geez, now we really lost. (laughs) Whatever ground we had, the enemy's just like, it's gone. So the thing that's exciting about the darkness and secularism that you guys as a generation are dealing with is that typically verticality, the brightest day, follows on the heels of the darkest night. So do not be afraid, be bold, go vertical. The story of revival is when everybody says, no, 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 it can't happen. It's worse, worse, worse. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. I don't know what to do. God steps in and intervenes. It's always the story. The brightest day comes after the darkest night. That excites me for me and it excites me for you. Because I think that's where we're living. But it's unpopular in culture right now to say you're sure of anything. You guys feel that? I know. Well, how do you know that? There's so much uh, deconstruction and tearing down of things you know. Jules, when we had uh, testimony night, you were talking about, sorry to call you out. This was not prepared. But when you were talking about how uh, evidential and, you know, the the, the science and logic behind seeing God move in creation and all these, you were giving testimony of that that night. Like, I like the mechanics of that. Yeah, me too. Because it's real. It's, it, it, it's, so there's this other dimension. We could make a case at the fifth dimension. You know, you got three dimensions and maybe the fourth is time. But I think the fifth, I don't think it's quantum physics. I think it's the spiritual dimension. The world laid over the top of ours that's far more powerful than anything we could know or feel. And when we are praying, we're touching that dimension. So here's what John says, the disciple of Christ. He says, by this we know. John has no hesitation of saying, oh, I'm kind of sh- sure, I don't know, I kind of sort of know, by this we know. That word is that word knowledge, gnosko, that is I really, really know. He says it two times in that one little passage. So you can know that you're Christ. You can know that you're his. You can feel free to leave the ground and hang to the rock that is Christ. Like think about that image. John says, by this we know. The second thing he does is gives a litmus test. He says, look, if you were maybe a wealthy person coming into this early church when Christ is moving, and you had a lot of money, and you came in, and you think you're loving God, and it's not condemning. John, the disciple of love, he's not condemning. He's saying, but if you have worldly resources, and you look at your brother or sister in need, and it doesn't say, and you, it doesn't notice what it says. It, just, it doesn't say you just don't help them. You just Notice the phrase. It says that you shut up your heart towards that person. It's a really unique phrase, not one we use every day, but think about what that would be for you to shut up your heart to somebody else, right? No, you shut down. You have friends shut down. 
you know, a rough dating relationship or an argument and somebody shuts down. You shut up your heart towards that person. So he says, here's a litmus test. If you think you love God, but you shut your heart to somebody who has need, you might want to recheck. It's not a condemnation, but it's a litmus test, right? You know the litmus test. It's a thing that says, is the love of God really in me and driving me? And then the third thing I notice about this is the thing I want to rest on that we're going to turn to James. Is verse 19 and 20. Again, he says, by this we know that we are of the truth. We shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Now, if you've lived for Christ or just lived in the world, you know that feeling of your heart condemning you, right? I'm not going to do you that inward voice that's saying, no, you're not going to, you're nobody. But that's not the voice of Christ. It's not the voice of truth. But he says, beloved, if our hearts condemn us, He's greater than our hearts. That's a real, real reassuring, joy-giving thing. Turn with me to James. Because we're going to do a cross-comparison. I'm going to come back to that little phrase. Turn with me to James. Now, James is not, James is not the, there were two apostles. There were two disciples, James. You guys know that? Two disciples, James. This is not one of them. (laughs) This is James, the brother of Jesus, that wrote this book, probably. Between James and John, James was the brother of Jesus and probably became an actual believer after the resurrection. Grew up with Jesus all of his life, became too familiar with him, and then after the resurrection, he was like, whoa, what did I miss? <laughs> a lot, and he became a believer, right? Then he writes this book. But James leaned towards legalism. You read the story of James. And John re- leaned towards action and passion and love, right? He had a lot of zeal, but he leaned towards love. He was the encourager uh, by nature when you read about John. James was the guy kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum. He was the guy that when he showed up, you're like, quick, look like you're doing something. <laughs> it was like the boss is coming. You know, he, was, he leaned towards legalism. Now, they both loved the Lord, but he leaned that way. Look at James chapter 3. Sorry, nope. James chapter 2. That's why it's on the board, so I can just turn around. James chapter 2, verse 14 through 17. Yes. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Or another way to say it would be, can that faith save him? He's going to say it here. If a brother or sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you not, do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Now that's challenging, isn't it? James is saying, and listen, He has legalist tendencies or leanings, but this is truth. This is the word of God. This is truth, right? So this is fully accurately true. If I have faith and I can't work it out, it's probably dead. That's a scary thing. Later on, he'll say, guess what? Even the demons believe. (laughs) The demons believe because they know, but they don't do anything about it. It doesn't follow through with their actions. Let's flip to this next slide. So what do we have? We have a dynamic happening here. I'll let you read that while I'm talking. Well, I'll, let's read it together. Faith without works and works without faith both lead to dead and joyless legalism. You can identify a legalist in a crowd. They're usually not happy. <laughs> you can just see this like, you know, scrunchy face thing going on, right? Or, or either that or like the Eeyore, you know, the... Mm, you know. <laughs> Not that we all don't have moments, but you can, both faith without works and works without faith leads to dead and joyless legalism, but works without faith has another piece that we need to look at, because action not grounded in truth can lead to fanaticism, fatalism, despair, and burnout. Think about that. Can lead to fanaticism, fatalism, despair, and burnout. So here we have two very different personality types. When you say there's room for everybody at the cross, when I say that, just be, have your hearts reassured and warmed by that because the reality is there's, it doesn't matter your personality type, your learning style, where you're coming from, your family background, whatever. There's room at the cross for all. And evidence of that is this. James and John, if you'd have put them in a room together, they would not have been friends. <laughs> John would have been like, I think he's kind of a curmudgeonly. And James would have been like, uh, I know what he's doing. <laughs> Mr. Love, action, run around, just like, you know, give, 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 whatever. You know, what's wrong with you? Just passion, passion, knock, sit down. You know, <laughs> these guys had opposite personalities. So look at, and look, how do I know that? Just in the passage we're looking at, James says, faith without works, faith itself without works is dead. So James over here, James is over here leaning heavily when he says, you got to have action. Then he lands on faith without works is dead. But then what does John say? You see it in the personality. Remember verse 19, 20 that we read? 
he talks about the heart. Because the person who is the encourager, the person who is the passionate from the heart person, the person who loves the Lord and is trying to encourage, they're also the ones that tend to feel at the heaviness. Are you with me? Tend to feel it the heaviest. When they feel heavy because they're encouraging others and we forget when people are encouragers that a lot of times they also need to be filled up and encouraged. You with me? But John is that guy. So John says this stuff and he says, have faith in action. But then he says, there's this problem where sometimes your heart can condemn you if you're that person. If you're that encourager, if you're that person and you're giving, 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 right? My wife will tell you that's not me as much, but I'm tr- I mean, I've grown. I'm more fruitful, but I'm more on the James side of the equation. I'll just be honest with you, you know, right? So I know because I, I had like that lion personality in college, you know, just do it, rah, you know, but then I hurt people that I didn't want to hurt later on. So I have more of that James tendency, right? But there, here's the thing, but that John tendency, that encourager, but John says when you're having faith and your action, when you're going vertical and suddenly your heart starts to condemn you and your heart starts to say, what are you doing? You can't climb this cliff. You can't do that. You can't be passionate. John stops and says, you know what though? Beloved, if your heart condemns you, he's greater than your heart. Christ can pull you out of that. And over here, James, who's the legalist, he's saying, well, I do want to have works and I do want to push, but I need faith and I need this. So here's why these two who are opposite personality types, here's why it worked for them. Do you want to know why it worked for them? Super obvious answer. I'm leading you. The answer is because they had the same teacher. They had a master leader, genius, rocket scientist. I always go to the George W. stupid joke. Uh, there's a comedian that makes fun of different, sorry, my wife had told me this is a tangent, knock it off. But uh, it's the, uh, doesn't take a rocket surgeon, you know. Yeah, I, I don't know what that is, W, you know, <laughs> kind of a thing. Anyways, sorry. Totally off track. We're not going vertical, just. <laughs> so, 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 so they both had the same master, the same teacher, the same guy that he could take this guy whose personality leaned way over this way and he could take this guy whose personality leaned over this way and he could say, come on, guys. They had the same master. They had the same teacher. And here's what we're going to spend the rest of the night talking about. So I'm going to be a real long time, but we're going to move through this. I'm going to give you a lot of framework to go in and read. We're going to turn next to, well, hold on. Sorry. Let's go back. <laughs> you were on it, but I, I did. Let's talk about this for just a minute. Truth, not, action not grounded in truth, can lead to fanaticism. What are we talking about? Can lead to, I'm doing, 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 but I'm so worn out, right? Fatalism, despair, we saw that during COVID. We all lived that during COVID, right? And burnout. But if I ground what I'm doing in my prayer, in my action, then it doesn't lead to those things because I've got a great master who's leading me. So let's go to the next piece. They, th- what, so what I'm going to give you is a framework here for the famous Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> and the reason I'm going to do that is because, one, it helped me a ton, and two, because it is the answer to how John can be so loving, so faith-filled, so passionate, and have an uncondemning heart, and how James can be so intense, almost legalistic, but have enough love and faith combined in that they come right into the middle. They had the same master. They lived according to this genius teacher called Jesus, who was not only powerful, could pray for you, could whatever, but he was the smartest man in the room. We don't give Christ that kind of credit sometimes. We don't realize the guy knew, right? You remember the story when he was, I think, 13, 14, and he's debating with the rabbis, and they're like, he won the debate. Let him go on. (laughs) He's winning the theological debates at a young age. Jesus is in Jerusalem, the Mecca, the a weird word. Anyways, Mecca. But um, so he's smart and he's teaching them this framework. Now I'm skipping to the end. If you go with me to Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. I cheated. I have a bookmark. Woohoo. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. This is the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Okay. Let's look with me and read with me. This is the conclusion. Therefore, see, John and James would have heard this. John and James would have been able to be motivated by action and grounded in faith because they would have heard and been taught and brought into this. If we're discipling and leading one another, this is what we want to help each other do. Therefore, whoever hears, Jesus says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, 
I will liken him to a wise man. He's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. Obviously, he's talking about himself. He is the rock. But he's talking about also the rock of truth, the rock of faith, works, all these gears working together. Verse 26, but everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on the house. Notice, same tribulation, same turbulence was coming for both, but totally different results. Beat on the house and it fell and great was its fall. Verse 28 and 29, I love And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching because he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. I told you he was smart. I told you that when John and James came in with very, John was the disciple of John the Baptist before. He was already in. When they saw Jesus, John the Baptist said, look, the Lamb of God. And John was like, I'm going to follow this guy. James came from Jesus' family. They're both very smart, very religious people. When they saw Jesus, they said, there's something way different about what I'm seeing here than what I've seen before. And the genius and spiritual intensity, verticality of the word for tonight, right, of Jesus, the intensity of him knowing the Father, drew them in and transformed their personalities. So, you ask me. I'm glad you asked. You didn't even know what you asked yet. You asked me, what is the framework or the baseline or the bedrock of the life, of the teaching, of the, the Jesus way, And I'm going to show you that really quickly in Matthew 5 and 6. When Jesus said, if you hear these words of mine and you follow them, what was he referring to? So let's go to the next one. Jesus says, so we're looking, I'm I'm just going to give you a framework. We can't go that deep, but I want to give you a framework because this was life-changing for me. Jesus is saying, I want you to do works. We did uh, the, the shoebox over tonight. Good job, his house. You guys are active. You're giving. You're engaging. You're growing. We were at uh, freshman uh, bonfire, and it was already a lot of folks you know, coming at the beginning of the semester. God's doing stuff here, so keep doing what you're doing, right? But understand and know that there's a framework and a baseline and a bedrock that Christ wants you to learn from the Word and from each other so that... Two years from now, three years from now, when you graduate, you don't burn out. You guys, I want to meet you on the street. Kent, I want to meet you on the street 10 years from now. I know, sorry, scaring you, but I'm scared. I'm getting these looks like, woo. Joshua, you're with me, right, Joshua? So, but I mean, I want to see you guys on the street 10 years from now, and I want you to tell me your adventures in Christ. I want you to be living for Christ. I want you to be doing more, and I want you to not burn out. I want to meet you at 20, another 20. But Jesus can teach that bedrock where you can be bringing people to him, living out of who he is all of your life, and not burn out, and not fall into despair, and not sign off. What is the framework? This isn't the whole thing, but this is so helpful. Jesus teaches a progressive, there's a progressive element. I'll just give you the highlights here. There's a progressive element in the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus handles the larger, most destructive sins, the pointed things that will destroy your life. And he progressively goes from the biggest things on down into the most pervasive things. And then in chapter seven, he comes in for a landing and teaches about prayer and not worrying and some other things. What is that framework? I'm just gonna share that with you a little bit. Number one thing that Jesus, by the way, he opens in the beginning of chapter five and he says this phrase. Anybody in the room heard this phrase before? He looks at his disciples and he says, unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Anybody heard that phrase before? It was a weird, it was an intense phrase for them because the scribes and Pharisees were the most religious people. So when you, it would be like saying, um, how do we, well, we're using rock climbing, so let's just stick with rock climbing. You have somebody who's the best vertical climber, and you look at that and you're like, wow, impressive. And then Gavin, you guys are on the front row, so I just got to, you know. <laughs> and then Gavin, somebody walks up to you and says, you know, you're going to be nothing until you're way beyond this most excellent rock climber. You'd be like, I guess I'm nothing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, maybe you'd take the challenge on. That was the kind of thing that they're hearing. They're like, whoa, how can I be more righteous than the Pharisees and scribes. This word, dikaiosune, it's a Greek word for rightness or righteousness or rightness of heart. It's the word when Jesus says rightness or righteousness. He says, unless you're more dikaiosune, righteous than them. Because the first principle is this. They're, they have external perfection but inward darkness. At one point he says to him, you're like a, tombs 
We don't have tombs today. We can't walk into them. But imagine a stinky, rotting corpse, and the stone is rolled away, and then you roll the stone back away, and what are you going to have? Stinking, rotting, nasty, nasty, I don't know what nasty is, nasty stuff in there. So at one point in time, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you're like a tomb, a rotten tomb that's whitewashed on the outside and made to look externally. Jesus is saying to his Pharisees, nope, he did talk to the Pharisees. Jesus is saying to his disciples, not his Pharisees, whew, went way off there. Uh, yeah, yeah, that was really wrong, right? Because they didn't catch me on that one. Wait a minute. Uh, Jesus was saying to his disciples, unless your righteousness is internal and a righteousness of the heart and before God vertical, then you'll never be able to live this way. You won't have the rocket fuel needed to propel you out of the gravitational pull of downward secular and everything else. And so then he starts systematically to walk through the biggest things that will rock through your life and destroy you and tear you up if you don't deal with them. And the first thing that he deals with, he says phrases like this. By the way, the, this is referred to, Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus' presentation of the upside down kingdom. He has this phrase a lot where he says, um, you've heard it was said, but I say. You heard that this person said this, but I say. He does it here. You've heard it was said, you shall not murder. But I say, anybody know the next phrase? You've heard it was said, you shall not murder. But I say, anybody? Whoever hates has already committed murder in his heart. Then he goes on to say, and don't say raka. Don't, don't, don't yell, cuss out, you know, don't do this. Now think about this. What is Jesus teaching? Why is he saying that anger and murder in the heart is such a big deal? Why? Because, think about this, how smart is Jesus? He's saying, if you want to live for me, one of the biggest things that can burn out and destroy your heart from both passion and being able to do works towards the kingdom is anger. Do you realize that contempt is not anger that's gone away, that contempt is anger that's chilled like hardened cement? When you get angry at somebody, if you don't deal with it, and the next day, this is especially pertinent in relationships, you guys. My wife and I have been married for a little while. We've learned some of these things. If you get angry at somebody and you don't forgive, and we've all done this, and you let it drift, then that anger can chill into contempt, and contempt is not better, it's worse. Because the next thing you're going to do is start talking about that person behind their back, start creating trouble for that person, start digging in when they're not there, getting bitter, and suddenly what's happened? Suddenly your heart has gone on a downward spiral. And so Jesus is saying, you've heard it was said, do not murder. That's an external thing. But I'm telling you, if you hate them in your heart, that's contempt. And that will, is he, is he, becoming, is he saying legalistic things? No, he's saying that will ruin your heart. That will ruin your heart. Why do we live transparently and reconcile with one another? Because if we don't do that, it will ruin our hearts. What's the next thing that he says? You've heard that it was said. Do not commit adultery. So there's a comparison up here. This is from Dallas Willard, by the way. You've heard it was said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, anybody know the next phrase? I'm doing these first few in detail so you get the kind of drift of where he's going. But I tell you, he says, If you look at a woman with lustful eyes and intention, you've already committed adultery in your heart. God did some cool things on my campus, Kirksville, Missouri. And one day I was right before a stats class, and I was there early. It didn't happen very often, but this time I was there about 10 minutes early, and there was this other kid sitting there. I don't know why I started a conversation up with him, but I looked over, and we started talking about spiritual things. I might have had a cross or something on. I was on fire for the Lord, would have these kind of conversations all the time, not annoyingly, but the Lord would just bring them up. And I'm talking to this kid, and he tells me, oh, I go to the Catholic Newman Center, and I'm all this stuff. I love God, and oh, I'm part of this one. And we, I was part of an organization kind of like, a little bit like his house when I graduated, and a group this size grew to five or six hundred. I'll tell you that story, but it was amazing. Lives were being changed as they are now, right? I say, that's why I say verticality, keep doing what we're doing, guys, because God can reach your campus. He can. We can. He can, right? And I'm sitting here talking to this guy, and we somehow get, I don't, I, to this day, I don't know how we got into this conversation in 10 minutes before class, stats class started. But I remember saying something to him like, yeah, you, so you're Catholic, so how's your relationship with God or something like that? And in five minutes, we just went deep in this conversation. He goes, you know, I'm doing good. I, I follow the Ten Commandments, you know, don't murder, don't commit adultery. And just, I said, oh, yeah, well, that's, but, you know, like, that's not the thing, right? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, like, that's just the external list. 
That's just the external list, the don't commit adultery. I said, because Jesus says, and I quoted him this, don't commit adultery, but if you've looked at a woman and lusted after her, you've already done it in your heart, and that's also going to ruin your heart. I will never forget this, because this kid started visibly shaking <laughs> in his chair. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know what I've done. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to have class. You guys, that idea, right? I was like, this conversation is going to end. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, I mean, he started shaking. Because somehow up to that moment, and you get, the Lord will lead you to sort of divine encounters, conversations like this. You don't know when and how. But what happened, what I, because I, then afterwards I didn't track him down. I, 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 looking back, I could have done a lot better with that. <laughs> I mean, like, look, let's talk about this some more. But when I shared that, Jesus said, if you've already, if you've looked at a woman to lust after her in your heart, you've already done it. It's as good as done. It rocked him to the core. He started shaking. And he's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Because, because he was like, I was like, well, that's just the external righteousness piece. And when Jesus comes along, he says, I want you to serve me from your heart. And I want this thing to be transformed from the inside. And so what being born again looks like, and right now I'm talking all kinds of languages kids never heard before. What being born again looks like, what giving your heart to Christ looks like is the inside of you gets radically transformed and changed. And suddenly you've got rocket fuel to live somehow that you could have never lived before. You can be vertical. You could have never done that before. But now when you know Christ, there's this passion passion and fuel for you to live a way that you could have never lived before. So it's not about the external, it's about the internal. And about that time class started. <laughs> he was shaking. Because you guys, but here's why I like to tell that story. Because I think in that moment, that kid got it. He said to me, how could I ever do that? <laughs> like you know, if you know your own heart, you know you've done this in your heart. You know you've been anger and contemptuous, maybe even now in your heart. But Jesus is saying, I'm not telling you just to do this for your friend. I'm telling you that it will ruin your heart. What are the next things? And he does this progressively. He moves on down through. So he talks about, you've heard it was said you could divorce. But I tell you, and he says, don't divorce. I don't want you to divorce. Because why? Divorce, that's about hardness of heart. And he systematically, you guys, the next topic that he covers, the four, items four and five up here, are about lying. <laughs> Jesus is pretty smart. He talks about adultery in the heart. He talks about murder in the heart and contempt. He talks about lying, how lying will ruin you. Are you with me? Because again, it's an issue of the heart. If I'm your friend and I can't trust you to be honest, you don't have to tell me everything, but if I can't trust you not to lie and be honest, then it means I don't know you. Caleb, you and I get to know each other. And if, you're, if I'm sitting, I'll, I'll use me. If I'm sitting there lying about everything, later on something happens, you're like, who is this guy? You don't know. You can't be, Jesus is saying, but here's the thing. It's bad for all those reasons, but it also ruins your heart, Right? He goes on and talks about revenge. Flip to the next slide. He goes on and talks about revenge and loving your enemies. And again, yes, we should love our enemies, but Jesus is putting it and framing it in a way that he says, you should also love your enemies because if you don't love, if you harbor hate and revenge in your heart, guess what else that will do? Ruin your heart. Are you picking up on the theme? It'll ruin you. You heard this quote before? Bitterness, this is a good one. Bitterness is like drinking poison, thinking it's gonna hurt the other guy. I'm so mad. You're ruining. We won't spend a lot of time on this, but in Matthew chapter 6, then Jesus goes through, because this brings us back to 1 John and to James that we read. Matthew chapter 6, what Jesus then does is he says, I want you to give to please me. Not because of what, not because of an external show. Guys, when you serve the Lord, don't do it because somebody will see you doing it. Do it because you go into, so he says systematically giving to please God, praying unto God, fasting unto God. Then he talks about treasuring. Then he talks about prayer. You see how it's progressional like that? And that's the whole framework we just did really quick that Jesus is teaching guys like John and James where suddenly they're able to live in a way that it's not in their power otherwise to live because their hearts are open. Their hearts are free. They don't want to be legalists. They don't want to be burnouts. They want to be his. So, I think we got one more. Let's go to one, yeah, let's go to the last slide then. Here's where we're going to bring this into land. Now, I had to share that with you. Because if you go out and try to 
stack up works and do all these things and don't understand the progressional nature of the Sermon on the Mount and your heart starts getting weighed down with all these duties and externalisms, you will be burnt out and frustrated and pointing the finger at somebody else faster than anything and you won't realize that what Jesus is teaching you is to be free on the inside so that it overflows on the outside. Right? This is a quote from the book, Willard. Well, let's read it together. Here we go. Actions do not emerge from nothing. They faithfully reveal what is in the heart, and we can know what is in the heart that they depend upon. Indeed, everyone does know. This is the thing. When you have friends, we think we're hiding stuff from one another. Your friends know what's up. It's always the case, right? He says, indeed, everyone does know. The heart is not a mystery. At the level of ordinary human experience, we discern one another quite well. It's the inner life of the soul that we must aim to transform, and then behavior will naturally and easily follow, but not in the reverse. Special term is used, we did, we, I showed you that one, Dikai Osune, but read that again. It's the inner life of the soul that we must aim to transform, and the rest will follow, but it doesn't work the other way. That's the mastery and genius of Jesus. Let's flip to the last one. Hope you guys are getting this. To me, this creates joy in my heart because when my heart condemns me or when I lack faith, I can go into the secret place and say, Lord, help me, lift me up. Show me scripture, and he will every time. Because he's like, when you're transparent, when you're who I want you to be, I will always lift you. And, and also, think about this. You heard this before? You're in a circle group of three, four friends, five friends, and if you're all looking out for yourself, you got six people standing in a circle. You only have one person looking out for you. But if you're standing in a circle group of friends, and you decide you're looking out for your friend group, every person in a six-person circle group has five people looking out for them. <laughs> Think about it. Just invert it. Just do the math. If we're watching out for one another, we're way safer and covered than if we're just looking out for ourselves. This is the mystery and mastery of Jesus. So what is he saying? I want you to do these actions. I want you to, to move forward into this. I think there's one more verse. Oh, there's two more. That was it. That was what we just did, five and seven. So let's look at the last one together. We're going to land it with John chapter 12. We're going to return to John. Does this make sense? See, when I look at John and James, I see totally different personalities. And I go, how in the world? Have you guys ever met friends or better yet, seen a married couple and gone, how in the world? (laughs) Like these are, you know, the phrase opposites attract. Anybody ever met a married couple and thought, how in the world did these two people not only become friends, but wind up together? Yeah, Noah's raising his hand back there. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Thank you. Noah, you will, testimony night, prepare your story. Okay, here we go. So, so uh, we want to hear. But I mean, these things happen. How is it possible? Things in the kingdom of God are possible that aren't possible anywhere else. We can become friends with de- opposite people than us because James and John are totally opposite people and the genius of Christ brings them into a life of community, of prayerful love where they begin to live together and they're aligned under the master. And they're friends. They're close. They're totally different people. So what do we hear from John? Love and thunder. We're going to close with this passage. John chapter 12. We're going to go right back to the man himself and hear him say to us yet again in really clear terminology, this is what I've learned. John chapter 12, start in verse 23. By the way, before I read this, because we're going to close with this. We're going to go to questions. we got some questions on this verticality theme. It's kind of hard to say, verticality. Verticality theme. Um, we're going to talk, have group discussion. But afterwards, when we come back and do worship, there's always folks standing around praying. My wife and I are standing around ready with the orange lanyards, usually standing in the back. But Heather, Troy, Caitlin, myself, Joni, others. So if you want to pray for anybody, you, every Tuesday night, just in the hallway too, but it's every Tuesday night here to say, you know, I would encourage you this, whether it's praying with somebody or just praying at your seat or before the Lord, like take this to heart tonight and pray, Lord, help this go d- deep down into the roots and the bedrock of my life so I can begin to absorb this and be transformed in this way. And here's how John prescribes it at the end. John chapter 12, verse 23. Jesus answered them saying, The hour has come, the Son of Man is about to be glorified. He means go to the cross. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain or much fruit. The closing lesson, 
He who loves his life will lose it. But he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Here's the answer. Here's how two opposite disciple guys following Jesus became brothers. Became brothers. Became tight brothers. They said, unless a grain of wheat falls, that's me, that's you. They said, it's not my priorities that I'm going to live my life by. Right? I'm going to follow the master. Right? It's not my ambitions. It's not my priorities. Here's why I encourage you guys so much. Well, Zach, where's Zach at? I saw him in here earlier. We were just having a cool conversation back there. We are just having a cool conversation this week about, you know, degrees and what comes next. What do you do in life? We're all, you're always asking that question in, in college. Everybody is. But here's what I encourage you to do most of all. Right? John Wesley, by the way, I have to say this. I love this quote. John Wesley, founder of Methodism, amazing guy in his lifetime. The Methodists, if you didn't know this, were the holy rollers of their time, right? They were the hollering Pentecostals of their time. So anyways, just so compare that to, you know, anyways, take that where you want to. But John Wesley on his deathbed, dying words, like this is how I want to go out. On his deathbed, last words, raised his fist. Best of all, God is with us. Like that's how I want to go. Best of all, best of all, raises his fist. God is with us. Breathes his last. Like, yeah, right? Right? How do you do that? You decide that you're not going to live life unto yourself, to your own purposes, for your own ambitions, for the things that other people are telling you. You're listening. It's vertical living. You're listening to the source, the master, the one person who's more qualified, infinitely more qualified to lead you up that rock face, to help you find the line to the top than anybody else. And you press into him in the place of prayer, in the place of transparency of heart. You say, God, I don't want to allow my heart to stray, to get cold. I want to go after you unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. It can't produce fruit. That's us. That's John's recommendation. The disciple who Jesus loved. That's his recommendation. Die to yourself. Live to me. And if you lose your life, people will walk up to you and they'll be like, man, I knew you like a year ago or two years ago or four. Something's different. Don't you want that to happen? Like, I'm not even saying you just became a believer or something changed. I'm saying even growing in Christ. I want people to still say it to me as I'm growing in Christ. I want them to meet me five years down the road and go, something's changed. Because I can't do that on my own. Like, none of us can. Tonight, if you've never given your life to Christ, tonight, if you're stuck on your journey, no matter where you are, Christ stands with arms wide open. You can talk to Troy. We can talk about baptism. We can talk about dying to yourself. But as believers, as those that know him, things are possible when we'll die to ourselves and live for him that are not possible any other way. You hear that? It is not possible to live verticality, this vertical life, just on our own strength. We will burn out. John says, you know how I did it? Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. If you lose your life for Christ and his kingdom, you'll find it. It's infinitely encouraging to me. Let's pray. Before we go into groups. Lord Jesus, you are a living, breathing personality who comes near us and can transform us. Your word contains the essence and power and light of truth. God, help us be fruitful, even tonight, God. Anyone that's hearing or listening to you, lock it in. Help there to be hearts tonight that help all of us to say tonight, Lord, I want to go find you in ways I have never found you before. I want to die to my intents, my purposes. I want to live like these men in the Bible lived. I want to live like these women. I want to live like these things I see. I want to live a vertical life. I want to live a spiritual life. And only you can allow us to do that. So tonight as we talk in groups and discussions, tonight as we worship, be here, be near us, lead us to yourself so we can be with you what we could never be on our own. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's do groups.